Hey, we're glad to see you on our another shocking story. Enjoy watching. The Mellon Hair Salon in the heart of the capital has always been popular with clients. They came in torrents, as they knew that the haircuts here, though expensive, but always of high quality. Masters, were experienced with experience, went regularly to courses for advanced training, and were aware of all the new steps of fashion, and could easily bring to life the most daring ideas. Sarah worked as a part-time trainee. She had only recently been hired here at the behest of a good woman. So far she had only been trusted to serve older women and to cut men's hair, and she so wanted to try some intricate youth haircuts or coloring to get new experience and hone their skills. It was a job Sarah loved, a talent she'd had since she was a little girl. At first she cut the already shabby dolls at the orphanage, for which she was regularly scolded by her babysitters, and then, as she grew older, she tried cutting a friend's hair with a machine. She cut her second friend's hair with scissors, and she was beginning to get good at it. But the staff here was a snake. The two proud beauties Sarah had to work with, Jenny and Irene, were simply unbearable. Both were from wealthy families, and each had several suitors who bought them expensive jewelry, branded clothing, and imported cosmetics. As soon as they had a free minute, they immediately began discussing their suitors. In general, they gossiped a lot. Women were good professionals. It is undeniable. They have been working for a long time. Not only that, they were able to unmistakably, by eye, determine the solvency of the client at the entrance, and if they saw that there was a poor man, they immediately sent him to Sarah, and quietly mocked her, knowing that she was sure to earn nothing on him. From her first day on the job, the girl had put up with their jokes and mockery. They immediately disliked an orphan from an orphanage, thought that such a person had no place in a prestigious salon, and irritated her in every way, wanted to get rid of her as soon as possible. After all, she did not like to talk, preferring not to talk about her life and keep her mouth shut. But Sarah tolerated everything, kept quiet, and did her job. She could not afford to be so easily offended to turn around and leave, because then she would have nothing to live for, and without proper experience she would not be hired anywhere else just like that. So today, Almost before her break, Sarah gave Chimo to another old woman, listening to endless tirades about the terrible state of the country and how much medicine costs in pharmacies now. The girl cleaned up her workplace, took off her apron, and was about to go out into the fresh air for a bite to eat. Jenny immediately evaluated and critically examined her from head to toe and venomously issued, Where are you, Sarah? Such a rare blouse dug out. These have not worn for ten years, that's for sure. In a second hand, or what? Did you get it on sale? The women laughed, and Iron added, Watch out, or it'll steal such a miracle in the street. A top model of the 90s after all. That's hilarious. Sarah was so hurt, tears came to her eyes, and she muttered, Whatever it is, but my own. Not everyone has rich lovers and one trainee's salary does not buy a lot of outfits to buy. Sarah, like scalded, jumped out of the salon, bought a bottle of milk and a bun, and sat down on a bench in the park to have something to eat. She could, of course, have lunch in the back of the barbershop, but the thought of being pissed off during the break made her sick. Her appetite was gone altogether, and her mood too. Inside seething long accumulated resentment at the intolerable partners, it wasn't her fault, after all, that she simply couldn't afford expensive clothes and jewelry. Sarah tossed slices of bun to the pigeons, who cooed and pecked their treats gratefully, and she wiped tears from her eyes and remembered her troubled childhood. Until she was seven years old, Sarah lived with her miserable parents in an old wooden barrack, which had long needed major repairs and was considered unsafe. Her mother was very pretty, looking like a famous singer but she liked to drink, it was her curse. As long as daddy was alive, the woman somehow held on, even though he often beat her for drinking like a coward's goat. Daddy adored Sarah, called her sweetie, and always brought her a present from work. Even if it was a small apple or a plain cookie, 
Her daughter was always happy and gave her daddy a big hug. But when Sarah was five, her father was gone. He caught fire in the furnace room of the factory. The girl cried and screamed terribly at the funeral. She longed for her father. After he died, her mother went completely crazy. She quit her job as a janitor, started drinking a lot of alcohol, started taking men home. It was hell in there now. The perpetual smell of her booze mixed with tobacco smoke, a pile of dirty dishes and leftovers on the table, piles of cockroaches scattered along the walls, and drunken men's faces replacing one another. Many people looked at Sarah strangely and said, she's too young. We'll let her go to waste when she grows up too. She'll be like her mother, working off her debts. They drove Sarah out into the street in all kinds of weather, so she wouldn't get in the way of entertainment, and the child would spend the night in the staircase or at the neighbors until late at night, or even into the morning. They took pity on the poor little girl, fed her, saw that the child had become quite neglected and had not washed or dressed dirty for a long time, and there was loud music and drunken cursing mixed with groans coming from their room until morning. They repeatedly called the precinct officer and tried to reason with the unfortunate mother, but it was pointless. She looked at her daughter with cloudy, empty, glassy eyes and snarled. It was you, you little bastard, you set it all up. You set the neighbors on me, didn't you? Well, then I'm going to teach you. I'll make you sing. And she put her father's heavy belt over the frightened Sarah's head. The girl screamed as hard as she could, trying to placate the closest person. Mommy, don't. I love you. Don't drink anymore. I want to live like we used to with daddy. You weren't like this. She got even more heated, shook the baby, and yelled. With daddy? There is no daddy anymore. He's dead. He's resting in the damp ground. And what am I supposed to do now? I earn my living the way I do. Don't you dare tell your mother how to live her life. A copy of your father. She's just a little girl, but she's trying to teach her mother. I could have killed her. And she raised her hand to Sarah, who screamed and covered her hands and begged her not to be touched. The neighbors couldn't stand it. And this time they called not only the police, but the child welfare service. It was not the right thing for a girl to grow up in such an atmosphere. Otherwise, she might grow up to follow in her mother's footsteps. That is how Sarah ended up in the orphanage. At first, she was sick and disgusted with the dull official walls and the total strangers who had nothing to do with her. She would sit on the windowsill, put her arms around her head, close her eyes, and remember how good it had been when daddy was alive. Mama didn't drink so much, was cheerful, and daddy read her fairy tales and made delicious butter and sausage sandwiches. Sarah wanted to go back to that happy time, or at least get through to mommy's heart and convince her to stop drinking. The child's brain refused to accept the harsh reality. At first her mother came, crying, repenting, promising that she would get better. Sarah still loved her, believed her, and waited for her to take her back. But a few days would go by, and the woman would go on another binge. There was no trace of her former beauty. Now her mother looked like a monster from a horror movie. Wrinkles, puffiness, bags under her eyes, and the absence of her front teeth, knocked out by another suitor, made her look like an old woman in her sixties. Understandably, this couldn't go on much longer and a year later Sarah was informed that her hapless, dysfunctional mother had died by choking on a shot of vodka. It is difficult to say what Sarah experienced at that moment. Everything inside was mixed up. Hatred and resentment against her mother had long been seated in her soul, outweighing her love for her on the scales. They were mixed with pity and remnants of love, so the girl was even somewhat relieved to learn that her mother was gone. The orphanage, oddly enough, was a better place for Sarah than it had once been in a cold hut with cockroaches and a drunken mother. At least she was well cared for and fed. At first, the older children began to pester Sarah, testing the new girl's strength. But the girl was not shy, she had grown up on the streets, and she could stand up for herself. Sarah had a keen sense of justice, and she could easily beat up even the boys. Mrs. Victoria, an older kindergarten teacher, 
had taken charge of her. She liked the inquisitive and clever girl. She was quick at solving math examples and was already reading fluently, although she was clearly not taught to do so. The woman took care of the girl in every way. She didn't give offense and taught her life. She even wanted to adopt Sarah because her son had grown up long ago and lived very far away. But her husband flatly refused the idea. He was afraid that the girl was from a dysfunctional family, which meant that she had bad blood and would have a lot of problems. And what the heck, she would grow up and follow in the footsteps of her good-for-nothing mother, or she would bring a baby in the hem. So the husband gave her an ultimatum, either he or the stepdaughter. The teacher couldn't bring herself to ruin the family home, so she had to give up the idea of adopting. Still, she loved Sarah in a special way and spent a lot of time with her. It was Mrs. Victoria who first noticed the child's attraction to haircuts and her natural talent for it. While the nanny scolded Sarah when they saw another doll cut short, the caregiver suddenly took her in her hands and examined her closely. She noticed that the little girl was not just chaotically cutting doll's hair to make a mess and tried to imitate exactly a haircut. So the woman brought a machine to the shelter, bought special scissors, and persuaded a couple of boys to trust and act as test subjects. Sarah was not confused, and with zeal went to work, puffed for a long time, tried, finally satisfied with herself said, that's it, it's done. Michael, I hope you like it, and you will not kill me. And when the teacher saw the result, everyone gasped, Sarah, my girl, you're so good. Michael's haircut is wonderful. How did you learn to make such a smooth transition? Filleting the bangs. The girl just shrugged her shoulders. Well, I watch a lot of videos on the internet, how to cut, and it somehow turns out by itself. I like it. Since that day, the girl had many clients at the shelter. She cut hair not only for the boys, but also for some of the nannies. And it became easier to live. Everyone tried to thank her and gave her a little money or something tasty and the boys stopped bothering her, respected her, and she experimented on the girls too. She gave them elaborate hairstyles, cut their bangs. After graduation, it was Mrs. Victoria who got Sarah a warm place in a prestigious salon. She admonished her one last time. At first, be quiet, learn, absorb everything. Don't you dare to cross anyone. Such well-to-do people go there. You will always have money when you gain experience. You'll remember me with good words. They speak well of the director. He's not an autocrat. So come on, go for it. Hold on to this place. That's it, sweetheart. Goodbye, I wish you happiness. Don't forget me, come and visit. The director of the salon, Mr. Pablo, was a man of means and wealth, but a fair man. He had no problem taking an orphan for an apprenticeship, let her learn. The girl, frankly speaking, appealed to him, quiet, modest, with sad and beautiful big sky-blue eyes. She dressed discreetly, almost without makeup, and had long blonde curls of her own, which she always tied in a ponytail at the back of her head. He could see, of course, how Jenny and Iron were mocking the new girl, for the cameras were in the hall, and the owner watched them regularly to assess the level of service and the work of the staff. But for now, he decided not to interfere and wait. He wondered how long the trainee would endure and how she would react. Sarah drank her milk with the rest of the bun, sighed bitterly, and wandered off to continue her work. She had just finished cutting the hair of another client when a small, poorly dressed, bright red-haired girl entered the salon. She was as sunny as the sun. Her face was full of freckles and long red curls scattered below her shoulder blades. The child looked like a cute little angel, just cannot take your eyes away. The little girl came first to Jenny, then to Irene, and pointing at the photo she held in her hand, asked the same question. Auntie, can you please make me the same haircut as the deceased's mother in the picture? I beg you. I really need it. Dodgy girls immediately realized that the girl obviously have no money, too poorly dressed, so they turned her down and pointed their fingers at Sarah, who was just sweeping the floor. To that go, she will cut your hair. And we have no time. 
a lot of customers, all by appointment. The hens rubbed their hands maliciously. They knew that the girl will not pay. And the trainee had no money. Yesterday she tried to borrow 200 rubles before her paycheck. How was she going to get out of it? She'll have to put the money in the cash register. The little girl happily ran up to Sarah and handed her a photo. Auntie, you can give me a haircut like the one my mother has in the photo. She died a long time ago when she gave birth to me. And everyone teases me because my hair is frizzy and sticks out in different directions. I do not know how to braid it beautifully myself, and my grandmother is old, her hands hurt. So I want to go to school and cut my hair like my mother, it's very important to me, in memory of her. Look, isn't she beautiful? And my name is Rosie. The master looked at the photo, indeed the child looked almost like two drops of water like her mother. The same smile, eyes, and the oval of her face. She suddenly remembered her beautiful and so unhappy late mother, and it was so exciting and disturbing. How terrible it is to lose loved ones, to see their suffering, and not be able to hug, cuddle, talk to them, because the person is gone and will never be again. Sarah felt very sorry for the poor girl, because she herself was an orphan, just my heart ached. So she smiled at her friendly and invited her into the chair. Sit down, Rosie. Let's try to make you the same hair though. Your mother is really beautiful. You're right. You look a lot like her. The hairstyle of the woman in the picture was very difficult and intricate to do. It was not a grandmother's haircut. And for Sarah, it was also a professional challenge. She wondered if she could replicate the hairstyle or not. Jenny and Iron were indignant when they saw Sarah put the little girl in the chair. What a fool. The girl obviously won't pay. The girl won't pay, you'll see, and she'll get a nasty word from the master. How is she going to pay for that redhead? Sarah, meanwhile, cut the child's hair and asked her cautiously, and why did you come alone? Where do you live? Grandma is not afraid to let you alone. There's such a busy highway. The cars just fly, the little girl answered quietly, and I do not have anyone to walk with. No mommy, but there is a stepfather, Mr. Roger. I ran away from him a long time ago. When I was very little, I couldn't live with him. He drinks a lot, and he yells at me. He calls me the red-headed devil's brat. I live with my grandmother now. Her name is Lida. She's very nice and kind, but she's very old. She's 78 years old. She gets sick a lot. I feel sorry for her. If she dies too, then they will definitely take me to the orphanage, and I don't want to go there. So I try to help my grandmother in everything. I know how to cook potatoes and eggs, and even fry pancakes myself. I'll get a haircut like my mom, and I'll be the prettiest in my class. All the girls will be jealous. The girl's hair was docile and compliant, and soon Sarah was able to exactly replicate the masterpiece from the photo. The haircut suited the girl amazingly, as did the short, torn, oblique bangs. Sarah even admired her work, and Rosie loved it too. She clapped her hands and thanked the master. Thank you very much. It looked just like my mom's. Well, look at that. At that moment, the owner came to the hairdressers. He had to check the reports. The poisonous housewives immediately jumped up to him and started whispering. Mr. Pablo, Sarah, the new girl, she's got some nerve. She's giving the girl a free haircut, and she doesn't have any money. What's wrong with that? Do we have to pay for it? You'd better take care of it. Irene and Jenny giggled sneeringly, anticipating what the boss will do to the new girl, and prepared to watch the show with their eyes wide open. But Mr. Pablo decided not to get angry prematurely, but to sort things out first. He walked over to Sarah's chair saw a joyful red-haired girl with a fancy haircut and could not take his eyes off her. She reminded him of someone very close to him, and it turned everything upside down. She resembled like two peas in a pot of water, a very dear woman from his distant past. The man nevertheless asked the trainee sternly, Sarah, what's going on here? The girls say you cut your hair for free now. That's no good. We'll go bankrupt that way. 
Sarah sighed and lowered her head. It's my fault, Mr. Pablo. I don't deny it. But I felt so sorry for the little girl. Rosie's mother died, and she wanted a haircut like this in memory of her. I'll put it back with my paycheck, I promise. The little girl took a pile of change out of her pocket and spilled it on the table. Don't scold auntie, please, she's nice. Here, the money. It took me a long time to collect it. Well, look how well she cut my hair, a copy of my mother's hair. I like it very much. What about you? The director took the picture in his hands and pale as chalk. His forehead was covered with cold sweat. He blotted it nervously with his handkerchief and whispered as if in a delirium. It cannot be. Julia, my darling, so many years have passed. I have found something of you. I can't believe it. He stared shocked, now at Rosie, now at her mother's picture, comparing and repeating. Rosie, how old are you? How old are you? How long ago did your mother die? Where do you live? It's important for me to know. Answer, please. Surprised by this response, the little girl answered. I'm seven years old, now I'm going to school. My mother died a long time ago. It's true her name was Julia. I live nearby, 8 Mira Street with my grandmother. Why? Did you know my mother? Yes, so you won't scold your aunt. Because I have to go, I have to run. My grandmother will be worried that I'm gone for so long. Mr. Pablo said, thinking about something of his own. I won't scold anyone. Run and take the change. It will come in handy. Can I come visit you soon? I need to talk to your grandmother. Can you send her away? The little girl laughed. No, of course you can come. I'll treat you to tea and bagels. We don't get many visitors, so I'm always glad to have them. Thank you. My haircut is just great. And she took off merrily home. Sarah didn't understand a thing. What was going on? She kept looking at her boss as if he was in prostration and went somewhere deep into his memories. Suddenly, Mr. Pablo, as if shaking off his thoughts, told her seriously, Sarah, can you help me? Let's go to this Rosie's house. I really need it. I'm ashamed of it myself. But before we do, I want to tell you something so you know how I know her mother. Shocked Sarah nodded her head and replied, Okay, as you say. Right now or after work, may I ask why you decided to confide in me? Mr. Pablo answered decisively, Right now, why wait? I have to find out everything. And who else can I trust around here? Those two gossipy women. So the whole town would know all the secrets. I don't think so. I've been watching you for a long time, Sarah. I think you're a good and honest person, and you're obviously not chatty. Get dressed. Let's go. Dumbfounded, Jenny and Iron watched as the owner almost ran out of the salon on the arm of this new girl and immediately began to gossip about her. Yes, we underestimated the orphan. She was smarter than all of us. She pretended to be a poor sheep and won our boss's heart. What a bitch. You wouldn't know it. She looks so modest. When Sarah and Mr. Pablo got in the car, he said, listen to what I have to say, then tell me what you think. Whether I'm right or wrong, it was a long time ago. I was at university in my final year, like all normal students like to go to the disco or dancing in the park at weekends. One day I was coming home and noticed that two drunken guys were molesting a girl who was crying and asking not to be touched. So I stepped in and defended her honor so to speak. I was able to beat the perpetrators, and they scattered away. That was my Julia. I fell in love with this red-haired wonder from the first minute. Her pretty face, with its little upturned nose, was streaked with freckles, and her mop of red hair reached to her shoulder blades. The bride was from a simple, even poor family. She was brought up by her mother alone, and lived modestly. They could barely make ends meet, there was no money for university, so she went to school to become a sewing seamstress. Between us, there was an immediate spark that ran. There was a crazy mutual attraction. The romance spun with breakneck speed. I was encouraged by the fact that I was Julia's first man, 
which means that she is not a promiscuous, decent girl. We had been dating for about six months and decided that it was time to tell our parents everything and get married. We were sure of our feelings for each other. We were already making far-reaching plans to have children and grow old together. It seemed to me like that was how it was going to be. I invited my fiancé to my house, happily announced to my parents that I intended to get married. My bride was already very worried, but she didn't lie. She honestly told me where she lived and where she studied. But my parents reacted very strongly, even I did not expect that. My father and mother did not share my joy at all. My mother ridiculed Julia harshly. She called her a pauper. I remember verbatim what she shouted at her. What? You met a rich guy and decided to sink your teeth into him. You think you got your lucky ticket? No, she didn't. We don't want such a daughter-in-law without money or a proper education. What am I going to tell my friends that my daughter-in-law is a seamstress in a factory? It's a disgrace. Julia cried and ran away, shouting that she would never set foot in my house again. I ran to catch up with her and reassure her. We both knew that after such a stunning scandal, it was unlikely that things would work out with my parents. But I did not abandon my fiancé. We began to rent an apartment and live together. Only I was a student and I did not have my own steady income, mastered the basics of business. My father spitefully blocked all my cards and gave me an ultimatum. Either I return home alone or he no longer finances me. He said if you want to start a family, you have to do it yourself. Julia also did not sit idle. She sewed at home, took orders. I worked part-time courier, in general, somehow survived. But still we barely had enough money to pay rent and food, and about other expenses, and there was nothing to talk about. But for me, after a well-fed and affluent life of a rich man, it all seemed like a trial, a nightmare, not a life. I'm used to wearing only branded clothing, if perfume, then French and watches, so Rolex, and I gradually became more and more annoyed with Julia and me modest family life, although I still loved her much. That day my mother called me and said she invites me to visit, they're coming important people, my father's colleagues, and I must attend. She hinted that it would be better if I came alone. Julia really wouldn't go anyway. I dressed up, kissed my beloved, said I wouldn't be late, and left. The evening passed dull and monotonous, talking about partnership and business. Except that the daughter of a foreign partner, Hannah, did not take her eyes off me the whole time. She was very beautiful, well-groomed, there was nothing to complain about. But I loved Julia, and I didn't pay any attention to the visiting guest. Everyone started to leave, and Hannah suddenly asked, Pablo, could you take me to my hotel? I'm a new driver, I've had too much to drink, and I don't want to drive. I'd really like to talk to someone my own age and relax, because my father is boring me with all his talk about work. I suspected absolutely nothing, the usual friendly conversation. We went into her suite, and Hannah uncorked a bottle of Cabernet in front of me, poured it into two glasses, and said, Well, Pablo, to getting to know each other, to brood shaft, we drank, and then some more, and some more. Then she opened the whiskey, and that's the last thing I remember. The earth began to spin, my eyes went black. I woke up in the same bed with Hannah, and jumped up like a maniac. How come? I didn't mean to. What should I do now? My head hurt like hell, and the girl laughed brazenly in my eyes. You think you'll lie to your fiancé? It's too late to think about that. She was on the phone half the night, not letting me sleep. I had to pick up the phone and explain that you're a little busy. She didn't believe me. So I sent her some pictures of you and me. You don't mind, do you, honey? Look how great we look together. It's amazing. I yelled like crazy. How could you? Why would you do that? Julia and I love each other. And this is all some ridiculous mistake. I know you put something in my wine. I couldn't just pass out like that. This is ridiculous. Hannah didn't raise an eyebrow and just said, I think this whole seamstress bride thing is over for good. You're my fiancé now. That's what my father 
and I decided, and your father only supported it. Our companies are merging soon, and you're going to be the CEO. So think about it, what's more important to you? A life of misery with your Julia with zero prospects, or an exciting career and a posh high society bride? I only speak four languages. I graduated from two universities. Get dressed, baby. It's time for you to go. I need to get some sleep. And you're wrong about spiking. I don't do that. It's not my level. I just skillfully mixed the drinks you drank during the evening. The wine was the final point. Today is an important negotiation, and I need to look stunning. I rushed to my and my fiancé's apartment. But of course, Julia and her things weren't there. I dialed the phone and begged her to listen to me. But Julia would just say that I had betrayed her and hang up. And then I caught up with her outside the school, and I grabbed her by the arms, and I said, Julia, sweetheart, let's talk, please. It's all a mistake. I didn't mean to. My fiancé sobbed, slapped me in the face, and said, You didn't mean to do what? Sleeping with another girl. She sent me a bunch of pictures, so you spent hours together. Not only that, she said it's all settled, and you're together now. And you love her. How could you? I trusted you. I thought we were serious. Of course, who is she, and who am I? Go away, Pablo. I can't see you. You're hurting me. That's how we broke up, out of stupidity. And I put up with it. I didn't fight for Julia though I'm sure if we talked again after a while we would have made up. But I chose to go with the flow and not oppose my parents' will, to have a dizzying career. And I did it, I must say, very successfully. I have a network of hairdressing and beauty salons, as well as running a modeling agency. But all this has not brought me one bit of happiness. Hannah, and I got married, lived three years, and divorced by mutual consent, because, in fact, we were initially strangers to each other. And we both knew it. She was luckier. Hannah found her love abroad. And even had a baby boy. And I still live alone. There are, of course, occasional romances in my life. But that's not it. Julia is forever in my heart. If you only knew how sick I was of coming to an empty apartment at night and living all alone. My parents died a long time ago. There are few real friends and they have already had families and children. I could afford almost everything, except one thing, to be happy. Sarah was taken aback. Yeah, that's it. And why didn't you try to find her later? Mr. Pablo was silent for a long time, and then he answered. You asked the right question. I thought about it a lot myself. I just didn't want to spoil her life. She's probably married. She has a family of her own. She has children. And then I show up like a snowball. And today, when I saw her picture in the hands of this red-haired little girl, I was just like an electric shock. It brought back memories, right to the point of tears. And I thought, what if Rosie is my daughter? She's seven years old, which is how long ago we broke up. So I thought I'd go over to her house and find out. What do you think? Am I doing the right thing? Should I do it or not? Cause I'm having second thoughts. I don't think Julia's mother would be happy to see me, and she might not even want to talk to me. Sarah answered sincerely. You are doing the right thing, Mr. Pablo. After all, if Rosie really is your daughter, it is necessary to help the girl. You can see that they live very poor. I like this little girl very much myself. Such a direct and wonderful child. The main thing is to be sincere, and then we will see. Let's just go to the supermarket. I want to please the baby goodies. I don't have much money, but enough for a chocolate bar and a couple of apples. The man looked at her in a different way and thought, well, it turns out that there are still such sincere and kind people in the world. She was ready to give the last of her money, even though she did not have much. And those two money-hungry hens, Irene and Jenny, they don't know what trinkets to put on themselves. They bought a whole bag of food and arrived at the address the girl had given them. Immediately, there was the stomping of little feet and Rosie opened the door for them. Oh, hello. You're here after all. Please come in. 
Grandma is in the room. You two talk while I make some tea. Mr. Pablo went into the kitchen, put a bag of food on the chair, and said fondly to Rosie, This is for you and Grandma. You sort it out yet, from the bottom of his heart. The little girl was very pleased. She had not eaten such delicacies for a long time, thanked her guest, and began to lay it all out deftly. She looked at the delicious cookies and chocolate cake with interest. Her guest seemed to her to be some kind wizard, because it does not happen that way. The bedroom was clean but poor. There was only one bed, a nightstand, a chair, and a folding bed in the corner, where the baby probably slept. It smelled of medicine. In the bed lay a gaunt old woman. Next to her was a cane. When she saw the guests who entered, she fussed and groaned. Oh, good afternoon. Are you here to see me? Rosie, why didn't you tell me we had guests? I've got a bad case of arthritis and blood pressure. I'm sick with these things. It's a nasty thing to hit old. You must be from social services. About the benefit. Mr. Pablo exhaled, pulled himself together, and began a difficult conversation. No, we're not from social services. My name is Mr. Pablo. I own a chain of hairdressing salons and hair salons. And this is Sarah, my handyman. Rosie came to see her today, asking for a haircut. And she was holding a picture of her mother. I happened to see it. I almost lost my mind. It was my first and greatest love, Julia. We'd been dating for a long time, and we were going to get married. And then I was stupid enough to break up with her. I regretted it a hundred times, couldn't get over Julia. But for some reason I never decided to look for her before. Rosie said her mother was dead, and she was seven years old. So I thought maybe the girl was my daughter. If so, I'll take care of her, I won't leave her alone. Tell me everything you know about Julia's life. Why and how did she die? What happened? The old woman's face changed, and she had tears in her eyes. Ah, so that's how you are, you parasite. Why did you, you son of a bitch, betray Julia at such a difficult time? Didn't you help her? Did you bite on a rich girl? If you knew how my daughter suffered, how she wept. After all, she only loved you. Then all at once is on it has piled up. And don't worry, Rosie is not your daughter so you won't have to pay alimony. Oh, I'm mad at you, even though it's been a long time. If I'd have caught you back then, I'd have torn your legs off and not even blinked. You turned my girl's whole fate upside down. Pablo wanted to fall under the ground because grandmother was right about everything. He lowered his eyes and became silent, not knowing what to say next. There was an oppressive pause. Sarah decided to smooth things over a little. Let's all just calm down. Mrs. Lida, we came here in good faith, and now we mustn't dwell on the past. All men are sinners. Rosie's such a lovely girl. She looks just like her dead mother. I've only seen her once in my life, and I like her so much. Tell me about your daughter and granddaughter, please. The old woman sighed and began her story. In the very night, when this groom with another man's woman was tumbling, and Julia called all the morgues and hospitals. A misfortune happened. Our house burned down, burned to the ground. The wiring shorted out. It was so important to Julia that the person she loved supported her, comforted her, helped her. Instead, the same girl picked up the phone and sent her pictures. My daughter showed them to me. It was such a betrayal for her. She could not forgive me. My friends took us in for the first time. But we needed a place to live, didn't we? My daughter came across that unfortunate ad about surrogacy. She grasped at it like a straw. After all, we were denied a mortgage on our new home. How I tried to talk her out of it. How I begged her not to do it. I felt my mother's heart was telling her it would not end well. But my daughter insisted. People are very decent, well-to-do, childless, married couple of businessmen. They promised to pay so much that just enough for a new house and the loan will not have to take. Mom, this is such an opportunity. Why not help them become parents? I told her, daughter, believe me, after carrying a child inside you for nine months, 
You just can't leave him like this. And it doesn't matter who his mother or father is. You'll think of it as your own. Anyway, Julia got pregnant safely. Everything was going well. Those people gave a good deposit. But the closer she got to the birth, the more complicated the situation became. The baby's parents disappeared and stopped contacting her at all. Julia cried and didn't know what to do, where to run. After all, there was no official contract. Everything was just words. She wept day and night. Mom, what a fool I am. Apparently they didn't need the child. They changed their mind and changed the phone number. What to do now? I really do love the baby. And so no roof over his head. And now even one with a baby in his arms will stay. Why didn't I listen to you? The labor turned out to be hard. It started bleeding a lot and my daughter died right in the delivery room. It was hell for me, a nightmare. I couldn't understand that my little girl was gone. I was offered to give up my granddaughter because of her age and the fact that she was a stranger's child. But I took her in my arms and I realized at once, she was mine, period. She is as red haired as a sunshine. Julia had tried to live with another man before she got pregnant to spite the man who had left her. But nothing good came of it. He's hurting Rosie. I'll never give her to him. So it's just me and my granddaughter. The state gave us this room as firemen. It's hard for me, of course. And I'm getting old. I am afraid that I will not have time to put my granddaughter on her feet. My pension is a penny. The allowance is in and out. But despite all of this, I do not regret for a second that I took my granddaughter to myself. She is such a clever girl, my light in the window. She is only seven, and she does everything around the house like an adult. Our neighbors are good, and they help out in any way they can. That's the way it is. Pablo was shocked. Poor Julia. What a cruel and absurd fate and death. And if it had not been for his betrayal, Things might have turned out very differently. He took the woman's hand in his emotion. Forgive me, Mrs. Lida. I'm so sorry for the way things turned out. You can't take the past back. I never had a personal life either. I've never been able to love anybody but Julia. I only have two requests. Can you tell me where Julia's grave is? I want to visit her and ask her forgiveness. I want a proper memorial for her and may I come and visit you. Help out financially. Please don't say no. It's very important to me. Mrs. Lita softened, her eyes moistened. I see, you're not lying now, you're sincere. Julia is buried in the Central Cemetery. If you put up a monument, I would be grateful. I don't have the money for that, and I wouldn't refuse to help. My granddaughter is going to school soon, and I'd like to dress her in a modern way and buy her a nice briefcase so she won't be worse than the other kids. And the poor girl walks, all the things from someone else's shoulder. What her neighbors give to her after their children, she still wears. They said a heartfelt goodbye and left. Since that day, the lives of all the characters in this story have changed greatly. Mr. Pablo and Sarah began to visit Rosie and her grandmother every weekend. They took her to McDonald's and Disneyland. The child was just happy. They bought her a new school uniform, lots of fancy clothes, and a cool pink bag with teddy bears. Sometimes Pablo took the girl to his home. The three of them enjoyed playing, reading fairy tales, and watching children's movies. Mrs. Lida was not forgotten either. The woman was examined and treated, and she felt a little better. The businessman conducted his own investigation, brought in acquaintances from the police, and found out by name where Rosie's biological parents had disappeared to. It turned out that they were not scoundrels or scoundrels of any kind at all, and had not brazenly abandoned the surrogate mother. Shortly before the birth, they both died of a viral disease. That's why everything turned out so tragically. Realizing that besides her grandmother, Mrs. Lita, Rosie had no one at all, the man fought hard about the girl's fate. After all, her grandmother is old, very sick, and can barely walk. And what will happen to Rosie if something irreparable happens and she, God forbid, dies? They'd send her to an orphanage, and he couldn't let that happen.
To him, Rosie was not just a sweet child whom he had grown to love. It was a living memory of his beloved Julia, because the girl was just a copy of her. And every time when Pablo saw her, he felt so good and warm in his heart that he wanted to hold her tightly and never let her go. Things had changed dramatically at Mellon Barbershop. Mr. Pablo called everyone to an emergency meeting, and after resolving all issues, solemnly announced, Yes, and from this day on we have a big change. I'm making Miss Sarah my right hand and the head of the barbershop. Please love her. Everyone, listen to her and contact her with any questions. Thank you, everyone. Dismissed. Irene and Jenny almost jumped out of their fancy pants with envy. They were just torn apart. They clucked like chickens on a roost. Look at that smart little orphan girl. And we were making fun of her. The trainee was a hundred times smarter than us. Quick to stick it to the owner. And she's a manager all by herself. Sarah herself was shocked by this turn of events, she babbled. Mr. Pablo. Come on, I haven't been working for a long time. I don't have much experience. What if I can't do it? But the man replied firmly, Sarah, experience is a thing of the past. You will gain more. I realized the main thing. You are an honest and incorruptible person, fair and open. And these are the qualities that I want to see in my assistant. So go ahead and be strict with them. Because these women are always talking over and over and discussing new things. From that day on, there was no more mocking or joking. Irene and Jenny had been fawning all over Sarah to keep her happy. She quickly learned the ropes as she was able to choose her own clients and take on the most difficult hairstyles. She was not afraid to experiment. She did toning and colored, and the clients liked it. Sarah decided to expand, and now she got manicures, pedicures, and facial massages. Clients were immediately added. Many women like to come to one place and get a set of services at once. Pablo quietly watched Sarah the whole time and was amazed at her optimism, persistence, and determination. Sarah's appearance had also undergone a dramatic transformation. Her salary level allowed her to finally buy some really fashionable and high-quality clothes, get a manicure, and change her hair. And without that pretty girl just turned into a stunning beauty. Managed hairdresser girl also competently. For a good job, she paid bonuses, and for the negligence and could punish. Constantly arranged the shares, new items and discounts for seniors, and the number of customers has increased at times. Now Jenny and Iron had no time to talk and gossip. They worked hard not to lose their bonuses. Almost all of Mr. Pablo's time was spent with Sarah in one way or another, either for work or to take care of Rosie. They became so close that they consulted and trusted each other with any secrets. One day, sitting over a cup of coffee and watching the little girl concentrating on putting together complex puzzles, Pablo said, You know, Sarah, I want to talk to Mrs. Lida and become a guardian for Rosie, or even adopt her, for real. I've grown so fond of that red-haired princess that I can't imagine life without her anymore. Sarah supported the man. You just read my mind. I thought the same thing many times. But I'm afraid they won't let me do it. I heard you need to have a full family and a stable financial situation, housing, and then you can count on the fact that everything can be documented. But the most important thing is Rosie's own desire. And her grandmother's too. You have to talk to both of them and ask them if they want it. It's one thing for a granddaughter to visit good people on the weekends, but it's another thing to give them the baby for good, you know. Not everyone would dare to do that. We are relatively new acquainted, and the couple decided to have a frank conversation with the girl's grandmother. Mr. Pablo was the first to begin. Mrs. Lida, we have something important to talk to you about. Rosie's fate depends on its outcome. I'm very fond of her. No, not so. Sarah and I are very fond of her. She's a wonderful, sweet girl. I have every opportunity to raise her to be a happy child, to give her a good education, to bring her out into the world. Anyway, I want to become Rosie's guardian or adopt her. But of course, this is only possible if you agree and sign all the documents. You know that because of her age, 
you may not have time to raise your granddaughter. And if she ends up in an orphanage, it will be much harder to adopt her. And the child will be in a bad place. I'm not going to separate her from you or anything like that. No, it'll be the same as before. It just makes me feel better about her future. Rosie isn't just a normal child to me. She's a piece of Julia. And she's very precious to me. Raising a baby girl with dignity is the least I can do in memory of my first and brightest love. Sarah was supportive. I know firsthand that life in an orphanage is not sugar and there is no scarier place on earth, especially for children who come from well-to-do families. I would adopt Rosie myself, but I'm afraid I'd be turned down. And you have a lot of good connections and an opportunity. Mrs. Lida thought about it. Tears came to her eyes and then she answered quietly. Five years ago, I would have driven you away and would not let you near my granddaughter, especially my late daughter's fiance. I can see that he's changed, but I still don't trust him. But now I realize that I feel bad and the sicknesses are getting closer and closer. I'm afraid I really won't have time to raise Rosie. I've been thinking and worrying myself a lot about what's going to happen to her if I go down. She's just a baby after all. I see how much you do for her, how much you care for her, and I understand that she won't be lost with you. My answer is that I agree, but only if the girl lives with both of you. I like Sarah. She is responsible and serious. She will be a good mother, and I feel safer that way. But you still need to talk to your granddaughter. That's the most important thing. If she refuses, then I will not agree. The most important thing for me is that she feels good. You can't deceive a child. He subconsciously senses falsity and will never reach for a bad person. Pablo and Sarah looked at each other and nodded their heads in agreement. The grandmother brought her granddaughter in and asked her bluntly, Granddaughter, I am getting old, you can see for yourself. I get sick more and more often, and it is impossible for me to make you an adult, self-sufficient person. If anything happens to me, they'll send you to an orphanage. That's my greatest fear. Mr. Pablo offers to adopt you, Rosie, or become your guardian. That way I'll have peace of mind for you. How would you feel about that? Are you happy with him? Do you agree? Rosie was taken aback, blinked rapidly, and suddenly burst into tears. Tears rolled in large hail from her eyes. She ran to her grandmother and began to hug her tightly. Don't say that, grandmother. I don't want anything to happen to you. I love you so much. I agree that Aunt Sarah can be my mother. She is very good. And Mr. Pablo can be my father. But I won't leave you either. You are the closest thing to me. I don't want to live without you. And she burst into tears again. Mrs. Lita also cried. She was so happy that her granddaughter loved her so much and sincerely. She hugged her granddaughter, comforted her, and went through her red curls. Mr. Pablo thought about it, and then he answered the girl, Rosie, I understand what you want us all to live together as a family, don't you? And Grandma was always there for you, right? The little girl happily ran up to him, climbed on his lap. Yes, that's right. It's my fondest dream. Then I would be the happiest. I love you and Mama Sarah and Grandma, and I can't share you. The man pressed her tighter and kissed the red-haired top. What a clever you have. You are wiser than all of us. And this is a very good idea. I'll sell my apartment and buy a mansion in the country. There's nature, clean air, and we'll all live together. Everyone will have his own room and it will be good for Grandma. We can sow some seed beds so it won't be boring. And the city is not far, 20 minutes by car. Well, all agree. Frankly speaking, I've always dreamt of having a big family, so my wishes also come true. Everyone immediately agreed, especially Mrs. Lido was happy about the decision. She did not want to be left alone in an empty room at her old age, with her loneliness and illnesses, and being part of a big family, and still living with her granddaughter, seeing her every day, and not worrying about her future was the best solution. When Pablo and Sarah got into the car, the girl asked anxiously, 
Did you mean what you just said? Do you mean that you and I will live together as husband and wife? But you never said you were in love. You never asked me to marry you. And now this. I don't even know. It's so strange. Pablo did not let her finish and began to passionately and greedily kiss her on the lips. Sarah was just stunned and responded to the kiss. Her head was dizzy and her heart was about to jump out of her chest. They caught their breath and the man, not giving her a moment to recover, began to whisper, I'm an idiot. You're right. For keeping silent for so long, even though I've liked you for a long time. I can't imagine a better wife and mother for Rosie than you. Sarah, you are clever, beautiful, honest, sincere. You can't find such people nowadays. Be my wife. Shall we go right now and get married? Do you mind? And then we'll go to the jewelry store and pick out the engagement rings. And keep in mind, you can't get away with a fancy wedding. I want everyone to see how lucky I am and be jealous of my happiness. Sarah was dumbfounded, but absolutely happy. It seemed as if someone from above had heard and fulfilled, as if by magic, all her cherished wishes. It was incredible. Not long ago, she was crying in the park with helplessness and eating a penny bun with milk, weaving home to an empty room, and no one needed her. And now she would be a wife and a mommy, a homemaker, had a favorite job. What more could she dream of? Soon Pablo bought a mansion, renovated it, and the whole family moved there to live. Soon there was a gorgeous wedding, and Sarah became his lawful wife. She proudly led Rosie to the guests and introduced our daughter, Rosie, the best girl in the world. The baby really looked like an angel in a snow white dress and bright red curls. There was no problem with the custody arrangement, and within two months Rosie was Sarah and Pablo's daughter. Mrs. Lita was at first worried that she would not be able to get accustomed to a strange place, but in vain, she liked it very much in her new home. Now she was enthusiastically growing seedlings in the greenhouse and breeding new varieties of cucumbers. She also bought seeds by mail and planted roses. The woman was so carried away by this business that the days flew like an arrow. She had no time to be bored, and the sicknesses frightened her and began to bypass her. The child in the yard was also free. She was allowed to get a German Shepherd dolly, and now a happy Rosie trained her to her utmost and taught her commands. The businessman provided the child with a swing and a playground. Sociable and spontaneous Rosie got accustomed at once, met and made friends with the neighbor girl Lisa and they became friends and visited each other. Pablo and Sarah were not immediately in love. At first they got used to each other for a long time, learned to respect each other's wishes, give in, make the first steps toward reconciliation, and soon family life began to improve. One day the man had a strange dream. His first love, Julia, was sitting on a chair near his headboard, looking lovingly at him. She was wearing her favorite blue dress with ruffles, her hair arranged in a beautiful hairdo. It was all so real, he could even feel her breathing. And not believing his eyes, he whispered, Julia, how are you here? How beautiful you are. She put her finger to her lips, showing a sign of silence, and answered in the same quiet and peaceful way. I am not here, you are asleep. I came to tell you something important. Pablo, I forgive you. Thank you for Rosie. You're doing the right thing. Sarah is a wonderful mother. And soon she'll give you a son. You'll see. And she disappeared just as quietly and unnoticed, vanished like a vision, leaving behind only a slight scent of lavender. Pablo even jumped up on the bed. His heart was racing and he was sweating. He looked around distractedly and wondered what was happening a dream or a reality. A sleepy Sarah rubbed her eyes and asked frightened, Honey, what's wrong? Are you sick? Did something hurt? Or were you having a bad dream? The man looked at his tender wife. She was so pretty with disheveled blonde hair, held her tightly to him and whispered, I've been thinking, why don't we have an heir? How do you look at it? Sarah smiled sleepily, kissed her husband, and whispered to him, 
you want to do it right now. I do not mind. And the couple of newlyweds sank into the abyss of tenderness and passion. Pablo, as promised, put a gorgeous monument on Julia's grave and landscaped the area around it. He often went there with Sarah himself to visit his first love, and each time he never tired of telling her, thank you. After all, it was her part. Rosie became the meaning of his lonely life. The light in the window, looking at this red-haired miracle, he always, always remembered Julia. Thanks to a chance meeting with the baby, the man finally found such long-awaited happiness, a strong family, and in his soul there was peace and tranquility. Let it be so. Sarah successfully combined the role of businesswoman and wife, hostess and mother. It seemed the flow of her energy will never end. On the contrary, she was glad of it all. Taking her daughter to school in the morning, feeding the whole family for breakfast, seeing her husband off to work, she felt important and needed. She knew that she was loved, expected at home. And that was the most important thing. Now the orphanage and loneliness, a hard childhood, and the insults of her mother seemed to have sunk into the past and were in some other parallel life, and not with her at all. Sarah was able to let go of all the negativity and enjoy her present happiness. 